Okay, everyone, maybe we'll um, get going here just so we can maximize the, the time we have with our speaker today. Um, so today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Suzanne Roberts leonard um, She's the co-founder and director of the International Making Cities Livable Conference. Uh, the first one was in 1985. Um, so she was definitely at the forefront um, of the Healthy Cities, Healthy Living initiative. And it's amazing to see some of the work she was doing back in 1985. Um, we're still doing now. So <laughs> yes. amazing and a little bit frustrating. Um, so her work concerns the social, cultural, and psychological, psychological aspects of architecture, urban design, and city making, clarifying how the built environment affects social interaction, health, and quality of life. Um, she's written five books that summarize this very large body of work. Um, she's received numerous awards. Um, from the National Endowments of the Arts, Royal Institute of British Architects, New York State Council of the Arts, um, and many others. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Perry. Thank you. Well, I am delighted to be here and delighted to actually be in this campus for the very first time in my life and to find out what you're doing in public health and social sciences. It's a fantastic combination of fields, and I um, want to learn more about all you're doing. It's very, very close and has been for a very long time. My husband and I started these conferences in 1985, as Perry said. He was a social psychologist and um, medical sociologist. And I came out of architecture and urban design and did a PhD at Berkeley in social aspects of architecture and urban design. So you'll see as I go through my talk, both of our thumbprints are on everything that I will be talking about. Okay, the IMCL mission is to enhance the well-being of all inhabitants and all especially, strengthen community, improve social and physical health, and increase civic engagement by strengthening and improving the built environment. So that's our way of having an impact on the social life and the health of people. And the connection between public health and the built environment has been known now for quite some time, and it's been a field of study for some time, as you know. Um, Lowell Solomon said, we need to create the conditions of health. And this involves changes in the way the city is being built, and that's going to affect generations. So all the ways in which we shape the built environment affects physical and social health. But if we know this, and we've always known this, why aren't our cities more healthy? Why do we have such terrible obesity? Why do we have so many lonely people and socially isolated people. What, what's wrong with the way we've planned and made our cities? Well, it's because it's not only our value system, but also there's another more powerful value system, which is the GDP, which governs and shapes the way most decisions about city making are made. The GDP sees the city simply as an economic engine, as a way of generating wealth and profits and our vision of what a city should be and should do is that it must care for the quality of life. It must care for the health of people and the health of the earth. So the GDP goal, as I said, is to maximize economic growth and the fastest way you can do that is through construction. And that is why after the Second World War, there was this huge emphasis on developing sprawl, we now call it sprawl, suburban housing, because that was just a way of increasing uh, the economy as fast as possible. But now developers have found a much better way of making much bigger profits, and that is through what we call sprawl. So there's horizontal sprawl, which is no good, and vertical sprawl, which is also no good. But we are in a period of extreme capitalism and it's a vicious cycle because the more we consume, the more we need, the more we don't feel satisfied because we're consuming instead of being with our community of loved ones and people who matter to us. And the more we destroy our environment because we're consuming more. 
Singapore was developed really by the West as a model of capitalism for the East. Um, and, of course, they built, and they built tall. And this increased the carbon dioxide emission so much that um, it became, in 2010, the top carbon dioxide emitter in the Asian Pacific, leading... Uh, Kakabadzi, who was then Wild Wildlife President, to say, Singapore is a society that maybe is one of the best examples of what we should not do. Uh, we know that China has created over a hundred um, uh, ghost cities. They are very gradually becoming uh, inhabited, but most of them are still empty. And it was primarily just to increase the GDP. That is extreme capitalism. And they have, of course, brought on themselves this terrible problem of uh, smog and pollution and destruction of the environment, threatening health and threatening the health of the earth. There has always been an argument, well, Housing, in order to make housing more affordable, we just have to build more and more housing. And uh, Hong Kong has done that, but it's now the least affordable housing in the world. So that doesn't seem to be the solution to getting more affordable housing. And prices rose 120% since 2008. So... Luxury high-rise condos inflate land prices and increase inequality. And we know from the uh, New York example, people have now for a long time said, this is just uh, um, uh, savings in the sky. It's safe deposit boxes in the sky. It's a, just speculation. People are not living in most of those buildings just putting their money there to store it. So what's been happening? All the money has been going into the buildings. We have a very unbalanced system. The money goes into the privatization of the building properties, and there's an underinvestment in the public realm. There's not enough money being spent or care being made about what belongs to all of us, to everybody the public realm, the streets and squares and public spaces. So you can say profit is privatized and loss is socialized. And we've seen this happening gradually for a long period of time in the suburbs and the cities where we've made streets which are really not for human beings, not for children, not for elders, not for bicyclists, not for pedestrians, just for cars. So very unhealthy. And this is one of the main reasons why obesity has become such a problem, because our cities and suburbs are unwalkable. Uh, and globally, this has been happening as well. So a third of the population globally is either overweight or obese. And it accounts for or contributes to, I should say, one in five deaths in the U.S. And for children, children now are getting diseases, because they're getting obese, they are contracting chronic diseases, which in the past only ever affected older people. So that's liver disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, all of these are associated with obesity. With insufficient, inadequate, or negative social interaction, Children especially are vulnerable to suffer loneliness, low self-esteem, social anxiety, and depression. We are creating a society, have been creating a society, in which social isolation is a real problem. It was for housewives uh, in the 50s and 60s. Now I think the, the population group who suffers mostly is children because they're very often told to go straight home from school, um, don't play on the street because it's dangerous, you know, play on your iPhone or whatever, <laughs> as if that's not dangerous. Um, 
But children are becoming more lonely and more depressed and more shy than ever before. They're spending more time alone than ever before in the past. Uh, but hey, this is great for the GDP. They can be medicated, you know, social anxiety syndrome. This is now a medical term. It's good for the pharmaceutical industry. And bullying and violence is also a problem which really springs out of social skills. Kids haven't learned how to accept somebody who's different and find them interesting instead of somebody who threatens them in some way. But again, that's great for the GDP. <laughs> I'm a, am I a cynic? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Depression among elders is a real problem, especially those who are isolated out in suburban areas. Maybe they can't drive anymore. Maybe they've lost their spouse. They don't have a work, work to go to. They don't have their social group of friends through work. Um, but it's really undertreated, and it's treated in large part more as a medical problem than as a social problem and a problem of the context in which people are living. And have you heard about hikikomori? In Tokyo, this is a very, very severe social problem. It's social withdrawal. And it's when maybe kids, maybe teenagers, it may be uh, students at university, it may be young people working who just can't take this sort of anomic environment, always so much pressure on them all the time. They just go into their room they shut the door and they tell their parents to leave their meals outside the door. And there are kids who have been hikikomori now for years, even decades. And there are 700,000 hikikomori now counted in Japan and another one and a half million on the verge of becoming hikikomori. And this, in my mind, has a lot to do with the way they're living isolated in high-rise buildings and not enough of an urban environment in which to get to know a small neighborhood or a small social network that they feel comfortable with. They've always been under too much pressure. And it's now, finally, China has recognized that they have the same problem and they've uh, counted, estimated 18,500 hikikomori in Hong Kong. Uh, and it's becoming comparable to Japan. There have been studies, uh, some of you may be aware of them, of the effects of social isolation on mental health and physical health for various population groups. For elders, it's especially hard. Um, and also for young children because they can't have the independence that they need as a little child to run out and gradually explore a little bit further from their home. They can't run in, you know, God forbid they should get out on the street. So they don't have any independence. And it's also hard for parents raising young children like that, as well as for teenagers and, the, you know, the hikikomori. Um, we seem to have missed some slides. Okay. So, I wonder if that is... Okay, I will keep going. There seem to be some missing in the middle there. We have a situation now where architects and developers, instead of planning a single building, they're now planning a complete city as a product, so that they can make the profits from the product of a city, not just from a building. And this is happening throughout China and Africa and India and Middle East. Half a million inhabitants. This is Songdu. Um, smart cities. Beware of anybody who promotes smart cities. We had a discussion about this last night. Uh, because this means, you know, it's selling much more electronic uh, facilities and monitoring of everything. But does it make a city that is more livable, more healthy? 
Is it really good for children and elders? It's a great way of marketing a huge product. Uh, Cisco has eight standardized cities in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, and 20 more to follow. I mean, this is production gone crazy. And this is even worse. This is a Japanese architect who has designed the great, quote, vertical city. But can you imagine growing up in that, being a child or being an old person in an environment like that? I mean, he's doing it for all the right sustainable reasons, ecological reasons. Now you can use the whole land for agriculture. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, I think we saw in the news yesterday, Gates, his planned instant smart city in Arizona, I think, um, just west of uh, Phoenix, integrating technology and high-speed data. And this was the image that went along with the story. Very um, smart lawns. Okay. There have, has for a long time been discussion about the comparison between cancer in the body and cancerous development. In, uh, and Conrad Lawrence was the first person that I ever saw who raised this comparison. Um, and who said it's like looking at cancerous cells when you look down on the sprawling developments that we're creating. It's like cancerous cells. Um, but now there are quite a few people who are looking into this comparison. Um, if you look at healthy cells, they have regular geometry, clear cellular boundaries. Um, they're connected to each other. They monitor the health of adjacent cells. They form mutually supportive community. They have slow growth and regeneration, and they perform a clear function within their context. All of the, that wording comes out of the literature on cancer. And, you know, cancerous cells are kind of the opposite. But you can see immediately parallels between urban development, the way our cities have been growing, regular geometry as opposed to overly large and irregular geometry or slow growth and regeneration, gradually adapting and filling in, or rapid out-of-control proliferation, or cells connected to each other, communicating with each other, forming a community, or cells that don't communicate at all. So we need an alternative to GDP as a way of measuring the success of making our cities. And there have been many attempts, I mean, uh, you know, Kennedy said that um, GDP measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. Um, the first person that I came across who was concerned about creating an indicator was Hazel Han Henderson, quality of life indicators. But now across the world, there's the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, uh, the Gross National Happiness Index in Bhutan, uh, the Happy Planet Index, etc., and IMCL has what we call quality of life indicators. And I won't read these all, but you'll see them illustrated as I go through. But there are many factors, but they break down really into four categories. One is we must facilitate access to community social life. Then facilitate access to nature. Then facilitate independent mobility and then create a human-scale, mixed-use urban environment, a built environment, which will facilitate those first three issues and be an environment that speaks to us, that supports our life, and that makes us feel human. So I'll just run through these quickly. Okay, the public realm is really the key to everything. We need a public realm where people meet talk and get to know each other and develop social networks. But look at those two spaces. There's a huge difference there. The one on the left is a shopping mall. Look at the range of ages. There's only one little child, a little boy in a stroller. Um, there are some teenage girls who are on the left in the forefront who are talking to each other and looking very animated and probably talking about, oh, which shop will we go to next for, you know, clothing? 
But everybody else is sort of moving through, not really stopping and talking or anything. But look on the right. So much more variation. There's a little boy and his big sister is on a bicycle. To the left of them, there are some children who are talking with some adults. And behind them are some teenage girls. And then there are some university students walking up and down. And then there are adults who are, you know, parents and grandparents who are working people and retired people who come from different uh, socioeconomic groups and who know each other. Uh, if you look to just to the left of the little boy, you see three men talking to each other and one is in blue overalls and he's a plumber. The guy with his back to us is a doctor and the guy to the, his right is a bank Clark. So, you know, these are all friends and they know each other. That's the kind of public space that we desperately need in American cities, not just in European cities. There's a concept called the social immune system, which is immensely important for everybody, all of you who are concerned with public health. Um, I'm sure you probably all know it, but if you have a strong social network, you see people every day, you have conversations face to face, you have friends, neighbors, you see people on the street, then you don't get sick so often. If you get sick, it's not so serious and you live to a riper old age. How do we create cities that strengthen the social immune system? So social network ties, the research shows general health conditions, resilience, quality of life, happiness, health of people with chronic diseases such as diabetes and so on. In Europe, um, of course, because public health is covered by the government, they're much more conscious of these connections and they are really making strides to improve public health through developing social networks, developing community. In 2003, uh, in the Netherlands, they called for a more developed and detailed governmental policy to promote community. That's a planning issue. How do you make your cities to promote community? The Swedish also understand the link. And in Norway also, they realize this connection between strengthening social networks to improve health. So in the Netherlands, for the reduction of health inequalities, intersectoral collaboration between the public health sector and physical policy sectors, such as planning and housing and so on, they realize is essential, but they do admit it's in practice difficult to achieve, but it's really important to work on it. And in the UK, in a book that just came out two years ago by Hugh Barton, you may have it, um, they say the well-being of the population is being used as a measure of success in national policy. It's influenced significantly by having strong social networks. So what are the ways in which planning and the shaping of the public realm can help to strengthen social networks? And the ideal solution, the goal to which we should all uh, aim, at least, is to create neighborhood plazas. Uh, that is very poorly understood in this country. Uh, we don't have the tradition. I mean, the Spanish cities were built around a plaza, that's true, but very often they've lost their function and become parking lots or, or green parks, which is nice, but it's not quite the same as a plaza. But, you know, back in about 60, 70 years ago, Martin Buber, the ethicist, said, architects must be set the task of building for human contact, building surroundings that invite meetings and centers that shape meetings. We have to do it. So I mentioned depression among elders it needs preventive interventions, such as places where elders can get to to do their marketing where they might meet some foreigner who is strange and interesting and um, they can't quite figure him out. That was my husband. He was, 
<laughs> was always going up to strangers and starting conversations and somehow always made a contact. Um, or, you know, a, the chess board in the park where friends meet, you know, regularly every, every week and play chess together. European cities all have main plazas and that's really valuable for gathering people from all over the city together for special events, for festivals, for concerts, for all kinds of events that reflect the character of the city. So people really develop a sense of civic pride and, and belonging together and sociability. Peter Benson, if you're involved with the study of children at all, he may be familiar. He said, we must embed our children in webs of sustained relationships. It's not enough for children to grow up just with their parents, maybe a neighbor or two, and then the teachers. They have to have a network of people in the community of different backgrounds, different ages, and learn how to interact with them. Even before a child can talk, there is a huge amount of learning of social skills that's going on, that can go on. When this little boy is introduced to a stranger in the marketplace and he is communicating, they are communicating together through tone of voice, through facial expression, through touch. And that little child is learning to understand who that person is and are they friendly? towards him, or are they interested, or are they a threatening person? He's learning a huge amount in that interaction without any words, and that's really the foundation of all learning of all social skills. We, my husband and I, spent many years studying social interaction on, in public spaces, and this, the one at the top, was one of our favorite places to study life. It happens to be in Venice, uh, called Campo Santa Margherita. And you look around in the afternoon, people are coming home from work, and they're going shopping, they may be picking something up for dinner, and they run across a friend who's in the campo, and they stop and have a conversation. So all of these little groups of conversations develop, and it's all very civilized. You stop and you talk for a few minutes, and then maybe you go on, or you see somebody else and you move on. And you look around, and the little children have learned that same pattern of interaction already. Very civilized. They're talking to each other, and they're exchanging gossip and jokes, and having a good time together. So, you know, kids pick up what they see around them, the behavior they see around them, the way of interacting they see around them. It's very easy in a good context. Sociability is perhaps the most valuable form of social interaction. This is so, social interaction not for anyone's particular gain, but for everybody's gain. It's the kind of interaction that makes everybody feel good. Um, you don't put anybody down. You don't make yourself more important. You maybe tell jokes or you tell something funny that happened or you just share what's going on in your life. You listen to each other. That's sociability. It's a democracy of equals. And that skill, it's a real, it's the art of social interaction. It's learned in good public places, I think. So if we want this kind of opportunity to develop social networks, we need to have public places that are, first of all, traffic free, because both children need to have the freedom to run around. And if there's traffic, it feels too dangerous and maybe it's too loud, so you can't hear what somebody is saying. As you get older, I begin to notice these things. Um, it has to be a place that supports many activities. So you go there to shop or to go to the market stall or to go to the post office or to the bank or you walk through on your way to school or work. Uh, there are cafes, you go stop there for a coffee or a meal and so on. So it must support many activities, especially small businesses because that's a more personal form of shopping than the supermarket. Um, 
cafes and restaurants are great because they make the space safe also in the evening. Uh, farmers markets are great because they bring people together for not only for the fresh food and the healthy diet, but also for the social experience. People meet at the market. You need to have people living over the ground floor shops and restaurants so that you have the eyes on the street. Are all of you familiar with Jane Jacobs' eyes on the street? Yes, yes, of course you are. Um, the death and life of great American cities, an enormously important classic in this field. But the eyes on the street maintain the safety and the sociability in the public realm. Really important. And you need to have a space that has the right proportions. So the proportions of the height of the buildings to the width of the space. And this is something that architects have forgotten how to do. Um, we have an angle of vision of 50 degrees from the horizontal. Um, if we can see a little sky above the surrounding buildings, we feel more comfortable. As human beings we, beings, we don't feel that the buildings are pressing down on us or that we're in a chasm or a, at the bottom of a well or something. So we feel more comfortable. So that really defines how you should design. You need an area in the center where everybody can talk to each other. You can look around and everybody can see a little bit of sky above the buildings. Uh, and this is Plaza de John Lennon Barcelona, which I was mentioning. It's a perfectly uh, designed square, good size. The buildings are actually six stories high on one side anyway, but they've been stepped back, look at that, so that they don't interrupt that angle of vision, so that it's a very, very uh, lively square, as you could see. Um, and this is exactly the same size as the square in northwest Portland that uh, I was talking about. We have a terrible story. I'm not going to tell you about something that the developers are creating in Portland. Um, but look, Plaza de John Lennon, there's this large purple area in the middle where you can see the sky in all directions and paths are crossing and it really feels very good. Okay, moving on. We know elders need seating, which has backrests and armrests. Um, but more important than that, perhaps, is to have seating that allows people to at least face each other or catch each other's eye or have some communication, talk to each other. So little curved benches is good for a group of friends. The tables and chairs around them is good. Uh, but also, even... Chairs sort of in a row, but slightly curved, so that somebody sitting at one end can see and catch the eye of somebody sitting at the other end, because then maybe they're watching something that's happening in the public realm, and they both laugh or smile, and they catch each other's eye laughing or smiling, they say, yeah. <laughs> and that's the first little step between, you know, strangers beginning to know each other and talk to each other. We know also that little children like steps and ledges better than benches, right? It's not such a commitment to sitting down, so that's important. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that it's wonderful for kids to be able to play in a little bit of water. It doesn't have to be a huge field of fountains, but just a little bit of water is really, really great and something that they can climb on and that they understand what it is, that it tells a story to them. It tells them something about their city or about the neighborhood or about people of the past. Um, this is in Bristol, the mayor of Bristol. That's the guy in the red pants over there. <laughs> um, he's an, also an architect. I went to school with him. Um, he decided he had to get people out onto the street again, take the streets back from the cars. And so he started a summer festival, which was every two weeks they closed the streets to cars in the whole city center and opened them up to people and had all kinds of food and events and entertainment. And everybody came out and began to 
really discover, oh, it's wonderful to be together in the public realm. We're taking back the streets. So festivals also are an immensely important way of bringing people together, having a sense of being a member of a group. In Siena, uh, every neighborhood has a, a dinner, which they cook together themselves in their neighborhood kitchens, and they eat together on their square, on their piazza, or on their main street. And if they won the palio that year, they may eat together, like a thousand people may be eating together 40 times that year. Imagine how that grows community and social networks. Um, this is back to Barcelona, and this is the area of Barcelona called Gracia, which has 10 plazas. Can you imagine? This is a population of about 120,000. So they have 10 plazas like this, all, almost all very lively. They're also known in Catalonia for human towers, a festival of towers made of people in the community. Can you imagine how much trust you must have in everybody else taking part, and how responsible you must feel if you're part of that, and you're holding on to people, and you're standing on somebody's shoulders, and somebody's going to climb on your shoulders and build a tower. This is the. Look at that. Is that a symbol of social bonds and social networks, or is it? <laughs> it's incredible. Sometimes they go up to 10 levels. So that's a community with strong social bonds. OK, moving on. Many of you are working in the field of the importance of green and nature for health. Uh, very, very important to have parks and green areas. It supports activity and so on. Um, and maybe a little green string along the uh, waterway is as important or more important, actually, than a great big park that you can't get to very often. Um, the red is the housing and the uh, parkway. We've known, of course, that nature heals for many centuries, right? The Europe is filled with... Uh, spa towns where you go and part of the prescription is you walk in the park amid beautiful gardens and parks and beautiful architecture and you drink the water. But now hospitals are beginning to build or create gardens in, as a, a healing mechanism. We know that emotional health is improved by being in nature protects emotional well-being and social interaction, good for emotional resilience, and reduces stress and violence. So now, you know, what people have known for a long time, but it wasn't economical to do it. We couldn't spend the money on, you know, planting trees. But now, thank goodness, thanks to people like you, we've got ammunition to say, yes, this is important for people's health. We've got to do it. Trees protect cardiovascular and respiratory health. There's all kinds of good data coming out. And health inequality, the wealthier neighborhoods have many more trees than the poor neighborhoods. So we as planners and urban designers must plant more trees in poor neighborhoods. And the benefits of community gardens are well shown now, not only to counteract food deserts, but also to bring people in the poor neighborhoods together, especially, and to give children the chance of growing food and eating it fresh. How much better it is to commute this way than to commute on the highway by car. We have, you know, arguments now, thanks to all the scientific data that, that people like you are producing. And it's really good to have incidental nature throughout the city, to have plants growing up the walls and across the streets and in the balconies and on the roofs. 
and cities must be in harmony with nature. Um, the studies of endorphins and how nature creates endorphins and gives you a sense of well-being is really important. Beauty is important. We have to get this idea across to the architects. They don't like that idea. <laughs> no, they, really, they, they fight against it. Um, and biophilic design, um, the fractals, which you, you probably come across this concept, that nature has a lot of fractals. All right, and anything that then a design of a building that reflects that, the intricacies, details, coming more and more into details the, the closer you get to it, that's very engaging for a human being. That's a new town which was built uh, just south of Paris, uh, uh, Robinson, something Robinson. Okay, we know, I'm sure many of you have done a lot of work on this area, that balanced transportation planning is really essential. We've got to counteract the emphasis of the car in all the previous decades, consider children and elders as much as we consider um, working adults going to work, um, walking as important as uh, going, going by car and biking and so on. Therefore, pedestrian networks are really important for public health, but they need the right kind of urban environment. There is an obsession in this country as well. This study came out of England with ghettoized play on playgrounds, and children are getting bored with it, and they would much rather play on the streets. And there have been studies comparing the kind of play that exists on the playground, they don't spend as much time on the playground if they've got a street or an informal area close to where they live. They don't get as much physical activity on the playground, and they don't interact socially as much on the playground. So they're now developing a policy in England to encourage play opportunities in near home. And this idea in of Wohnstrasse, the living street, is really important. It's throughout hundreds of cities in Europe. It really places the pedestrian and the playing child on an equal level with cars. Cars have to go at walking speed. Obviously, we need wide sidewalks. We need to take back as much space as possible from the cars, create parklets. We need complete streets. These concepts are familiar to you, I'm sure. Uh, and we need to calm arterial roads because traffic you know, the survival rate for a child hit by a car at 30 miles per hour is only 50%, but hit by a car at 18 miles per hour, it's 90%. So we've got to change arterial roads from bottom left to the top right. That's a street in San Diego. Cycling is a good, but it must be cycling for children and elders. And we're not going to increase the number of people biking if it's not safe for these groups. Um, and to be safe, it, bicycles must really be separate from pedestrians as well as from cars. Or if they're with the cars, they must be brought to the front. There are all kinds of mechanisms that have been developed. But this is one of the best, to buffer both the pedestrians and the bikes and the cars, to separate them physically. And, of course, public transportation is important for health because you walk to the transit and you walk from the transit stop to... Uh, your destination. And finally, buildings shape the public realm. They are the walls to a good public space. They must be hospitable in order to create a hospitable public realm. That, I don't think, is a <coughs> very hospitable public realm. Architecture speaks. You know, Goethe said, Architektur ist eine vergessene Sprache. It's a forgotten language. It speaks to us, but it speaks at a pre-verbal level, <laughs> right? Um, we look at that, and does that building invite us in? Is that a friendly building? Um, architects deny any of these kinds of questions, but we can read the building, right? We know what the building is telling us. Would you rather go into that building or that building? Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference. That's reaching out and welcoming us in, light. and um, A space with a window high up, 
may be very oppressive or it may be very inspiring and lift you up. So architecture is speaking to us all the time. Um, very early on in my work, I did a study of authors who had built houses for themselves and how the architecture of the house they designed reflected their values that they had put into words in their written works. You can look at that and you can see these are very, very different people, right? I mean, the personality, their values, the way they see themselves, the way they see other people, it's all written into the architecture. I don't know why architects are still denying this. <laughs> That's Jung's house, the one on the left, by the way. <coughs> and um, my husband and I also worked on physical setting as a therapeutic modality, that looking at the psychiatric hospital. But you can tell the, just from the architecture, it's giving you a message about who you are and how, what is the appropriate way of interacting with somebody. Both it's a message for the patients and for the staff. So the architecture has a, a big effect on the therapy. The mixed use, which I've talked about, we absolutely have to encourage our cities to build more mixed use because of the eyes on the street and the activity. You know, architects are always saying, well, we need density. We've got to build high. We've got to have, you know, 30 story, 40 story building in order to accommodate all the housing we've got to build. But actually, Paris is one of the densest cities in the whole world. 20,000 people per square kilometer, and they get it all within six stories. So don't ever take any of that guff from architects and planners who say, <laughs> who say they've got to go high. They don't have to go high. Uh, and we need more mixed use. We need to have poorer people and richer people living together so that we, uh, we've been isolating different socioeconomic groups for a long time, building walls between them, but the traditional form of um, building in the city was always there was business at ground floor, the wealthy merchant lived immediately above it with his family, and then the people who worked for him lived on the top floors. That was a mixed socioeconomic group in one building, and we can still do it. The building on the right does it in a slightly different way. There are you know, studios and one and two and three bedroom apartments, and the top ones are luxury but you've still got a mix of students and different people living together. Um, that's inner courtyards are good when you have an urban fabric, integrate nature, uh, attachment to place, you know, protect historic buildings because they speak to us about who we as a community, as a city were, all our values embodied in the buildings of the city. And the city's DNA we talk about a lot because Again, it's the history of the city that is embodied in the buildings. Um, that's Portland, a city of originally brick warehouses and trees. Trees immensely important. So that's carried forward up until recently. But most of all, places in poor neighborhoods to improve public health and hospitable neighborhood plazas to strengthen the social immune system. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? We have time maybe for a couple quick questions. Um, and then we'll be, uh, we can hang around here afterwards if other people want to stay and uh, talk a little bit more. So any questions? Yeah. Um, I, I also share your skepticism of capitalism and how, how would you go about just pitching an idea for a home plaza to somebody, to a, a city developer? How, how do you share with them how important it is without a monetary value? Appreciate, help them appreciate the things that aren't just monetary. Well, the owners of the land in Portland, where there is supposed to be a neighborhood square going, um, was Conway, and the people in Conway that we were working with said, 
this is fantastic. Yes, a neighborhood square would bring so much um, quality of life to the people who will move into this neighborhood. And we will have our people, we will be able to attract the brightest minds to come and live here. That will be part of the attraction. And they'll be able to walk to, you know, Conway offices. And this will be great. But then they sold off this piece of land that is supposed to have a neighborhood square to an individual developer to create the square. And that individual developer only wanted to make the money. Um, so <laughs> developers are not often, often not the ones who will really understand the value of a square for the community. It's really the responsibility of the city because they have to be answerable to the community. They have to take care of uh, the community's health and well-being, and they should be responsible for the public realm and protect the public realm. But the more they are hand in glove with the developers, and they get money for their election campaigns from the developers who have the most money in most cases, then you're in trouble. But, you know, they, I, I was just in Bellingham giving a talk, and there the whole city council is progressive. They understand these issues. Go up to Bellingham and, and see how they are thinking about public health and all of the different ways they can improve public health and education and well-being and equity. All of the council members are behind this effort and they, those entities are all working together. So, you know, cities vary. Um, developers usually can't be trusted. <laughs> um, but cities should should have that responsibility. Yeah. My question is: <clears throat> To what extent? Well, first of all, uh, the quality of the city, how it was built and how it was maintained, cannot be separated from the political, social, economic structure that shaped that. And so, my question is: To what extent? Can a city by itself get ahead of the entire national political, social, like capitalism, <coughs> social structure? Just give you an example. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Monaco's uh, rating of the world yeah. city. Yeah. Portland is the only American city that being the top 25 city in the world for six consecutive years. At the same time, Germany has four cities ranked as top 25. Japan has three, Australia has three. So this is all highly related to the, the national social, political, economic structure. So my question is, to, to the extent US is not particularly conducive for, for a livable city, but Portland stand out. And how much can a city, like in, in a not so conducive political, economic structure, to get ahead? Mm. Good question. <laughs> well, as I said, Bellingham, a small city, is really moving ahead and improving quality of life and health and care for everybody. Um, and perhaps it's easier in a small city. I would say Monocle is actually a little behind the times because they haven't looked at what's going on in Portland in the last few years. So they may <laughs> drop Portland in the future. We'll see. Um, but cities, you know, different cities within, at the moment in this country, we have a top leader who does not understand any of these ideas, I'm <laughs> quite sure. Um, but if we can, you know, in a small city, work to uh, make our city a model city and really care, maybe Corvallis can do this even more than it's doing now. Maybe we'll get under the wire and be the leaders of the future. Do Javier? You think the, the issue, though, is... Uh... If you think of the Atlantas, the, uh, the Las Vegas, the Houstons, the, uh, I mean, the, the urban sprawl in this country has been brutal yeah. for many decades already. Yeah. And how do you reverse that? I mean, you compare it to Europe. In Europe, it's very easy. They have those plazas, those squares. They have the narrow streets. Right. They just have to liberate them the, for the city's pedestrian, yeah. which is fairly it's just happening. Right. And then it's done. Right. So the problem is that how do you reverse the decades of urban sprawl that has occurred? Yeah. In mo most of these cities, Atlanta, etc., I mean, are the ones mass fastest, <coughs> are going fastest in this country. Um, how do you, and with the capitalism 
um, behind <laughs> under developers right. uh, being uh, continuing to care about the GDP thing. I'll give you, uh, how, do you, how do you go back? I ha I'll give you one example of a city which is growing very fast and which is doing it at a human scale and mixed use and turning what was a suburban sprawl um, into a city, a European-style city, and that is Carmel, Indiana. Of course, they have money. It's a, a rich suburb of Indianapolis. Um, and they have a mayor who has a vision of what a city is because he's been in Europe when he was young and he learned what a city should be. And he has been in mayor now for 20 plus years and he started building roundabouts to slow the traffic. He's got 100 roundabouts now in, in Carmel um, and he has started building a city center which is using classical style architecture at a human scale, uh, very beautiful, with little plazas and, and parks and uh, really nice mixed use buildings. And it's very popular. He's doing you know, exceedingly well. So it can be done. And that's a, a model for you know, sprawl all over the country. Um, and he has figured out how to do it economically as well. <laughs> Uh, through bonds. It may not work in poor neighborhoods, in poor cities, but um, it's certainly possible to do it. Yes? So when you talk about this application to uh, suburban areas, too, can this be applied to rural areas where they, um, since we have such a population migration to the cities that we have these people who need services and we see that they're basically desert in a sense? Mm. Is there any way this can be applied to areas? Well, um, we don't in this country have villages really, whereas European cities, I'm English, so I grew up, you know, England has a lot of villages, but that is a way of having a small and more compact uh, neighborhood of people who know each other and have a place to go to gather, to be with each other. Um, so perhaps if we develop the concept of villages in this country, I hadn't really thought about this before, but that might might be a way to go. Okay, I think we're out of time, but I saw some of our hands up, so stick around and we can chat um, afterwards. So um, just join me again.